Hello and welcome to Kraken Krakoa number 15. Today we're going to be talking about where Excalibur number one fits into the Dawn of X. We'll be digging into the second non-Jonathan Hickman written comic released by Marvel as I continue to explore all elements of the exciting Dawn of X here in 2019. Today I'll be answering, how does Excalibur fit into the Dawn of X and Hickman's X-Men? What does the series history of Excalibur tell us about this story? And Answers to questions like, is Apocalypse a wizard now? Who is the White Witch? And how is a single word in this comic teasing the greatest cosmic crossover I can possibly imagine? Might be reading into things, but that's what I do here on Kraken Krakoa. We're going to get into theories, we're going to get into history of X-Men, and we're going to talk about Excalibur number 1 and my thoughts, because it's a pretty interesting issue with a whole lot to unpack. Before I get to all that, a quick thank you to Comic Book Herald's Mysterious Benefactors. These are the site supporters on Patreon.com slash Comic Book Herald who are contributing at the Mysterious Benefactor level. If you'd like to see how you can support Comic Book Herald or ways, of course, that we can get into, you know, like added bonuses, like extra reading orders and early access to some of my content, you can go on over to Patreon.com slash Comic Book Herald. The Mysterious Benefactors I'd like to thank today are Jesse W., and Morgan Blackthorne. Thank you, Jesse and Morgan, for your support. All right, let's get into Excalibur, Otherworld, and the Dawn of X. What is Excalibur? If you're thinking about Excalibur, here are the elements that typically matter. The Braddox, Otherworld, the Omniverse, multiple realities, and cross-time capers. If you've never read an Excalibur comic before, if you know almost nothing about Captain Britain or Betsy Braddock, a.k.a. Psylocke, a.k.a. now back to Betsy Braddock, that's okay. I'm going to give you a lot of background on what it means to be fans of these series, on what it has meant historically to, to follow these series in the comics. Excalibur officially kicked off as a title with a 1988 special edition, otherwise known as The Sword is Drawn, with the creative team of Chris Claremont and Alan Davis. The comic book spins out of Uncanny X-Men with a lineup of Nightcrawler, Kitty Pride, Rachel Summers, going by Phoenix at the time, Captain Britain, and Megan. Now, the two characters that you might not though know for the, you know, the non-X-Men people in that group, of course, are Captain Britain, somewhat self-explanatory Brian Braddock character, and Megan, who's a shapeshifter of sorts, um, has also historically had maybe some romantic interest in the character of Nightcrawler, something we actually saw play out somewhat recently in the Age of X-Men event that preceded Hickman's X-Men. Throughout the original run that spans 1988 to 1998, in over 125 issues, there are effectively two tonal approaches. There's the comedy-infused time-traveling zaniness of Claremont and Davis, and later Davis and Davis, as Alan took over writing and art with Excalibur number 42. There's a way more serious approach is the second kind of approach to the X-Men of Europe, where the team moves to Muir Island with Myra McTaggart. This era kicks off with some stories conceived by Scott Lobdell before moving to the more well-known work of Warren Ellis and Ken Lashley that introduces British intelligence liaison Pete Wisdom to the mix. This kicks off with the Soul Sword trilogy, which is not necessarily the most excellent Excalibur story of all time, and it's definitely not Warren Ellis's best work. You know, this is mid-90s Warren Ellis. He is up and coming at Marvel at the time, but you can see a lot of the, the talent that is going to make him an interesting creator over at Marvel. In many ways, Excalibur is also Claremont and Davis's approach to bringing the Captain Britain mythos they established firmly into the world of Marvel and the X-Men. Way back in 1978's Marvel Team-Up, number 65 and number 66, which we are covering currently in the My Marvelous Year Reading Club, check out My Marvelous Year podcast if you are so inclined, Chris Claremont and John Byrne actually brought Brian Braddock, a.k.a. Captain Britain, over to American audiences for the first time. The character bounced around in his own Marvel UK mags, including Captain Britain and uh, a series called Super Spider-Man and Captain Britain, which is amazing that it was even called that, among others, before notably ending up in the hands of the up-and-coming Alan Moore and Alan Davis. This is one of the most interesting 
eras of Captain Britain to me. It runs across a series of titles that none of which are called Captain Britain. <laughs> I will include uh, a link to some of the reading orders and notes and some of the collected stuff here in the show notes on the YouTube channel. And again, if you like the show, please consider liking and subscribing uh, or check out the Best Comics Ever podcast where you can subscribe. Or again, all this reading order content is over on Comic Book Herald. But Alan Moore, as you may well know, the, the co-creator of Watchmen and other various all-time greats, one of the greatest comic book writers of all time, I would say, in my opinion, probably the best. Uh, working here with Alan Davis, extremely talented creator, as, as obviously has a huge role in Excalibur here, their run on Captain Britain sets the stage for a lot of what's to come, including uh, a lot of the omniverse and sort of multiple realities. And I think, technically, it's within this run that more in what I understand to be basically his only his only real Marvel work, like his only real Marvel superhero work, um, they established Earth-616 as the designation that has stuck for Marvel uh, through to today. In the process of bringing Brian Braddock back into his care, Claremont also brings Betsy Braddock more firmly into the world of the X-Men, where she has remained to date. It's actually in the pages of New Mutants Annual Number 2 by Claremont and Alan Davis that Betsy's somewhat recent eye removal in the pages of Captain Britain is uh, fixed by Mojo. Mm, fixed being a relative term. From there, Betsy would remain with the Uncanny X-Men until her famous transformation during the Acts of Vengeance crossover into the body swap with the Japanese assassin named Conan that made her, you know, for most Marvel fans throughout the 90s, Marvel's Psylocke. It's also worth noting here that there's a third Braddock sibling, the Omega-level reality-warping Jamie Braddock. Jamie's the black sheep of the family, very much in keeping with the tradition of Legion or Scarlet Witch, remarkably powerful players with familial ties to the group, and flimsy mental stability at the best of times. Jamie is definitely the character that when he shows up, you know things are about to go awry, no matter how friendly or loving the, the familial relationship with Brian and Betsy may appear to be, especially especially if he's rocking those tight white thongs that he pulled off um, or didn't, depending on your tastes, in early Excalibur appearances. Another consistent piece of Excalibur is the location Otherworld, the realm that's home to the Captain Britain Corps uh, of all realities in the Omniverse. I had trouble with this one, but from what I've gathered, Omniverse is a collection of multiverses taken together as a whole. This is an idyllic sword and sorcery England, home to the likes of Merlin, Roma, Camelot, uh, Arthur Pendragon. To my mind, this is the Alan's greatest contribution to the mythos, a very Morrison's multiversity approach to Britain's protectors well before those comics became some of my favorite of the modern era. Modern Excalibur and modern Braddock. So there you've got the sort of history of the title in, in brief, right? Technically, there hasn't been an ongoing Excalibur title at Marvel since 2007. Although, even that's kind of misleading when you factor in the very fun and underrated Captain Britain and MI-13 series that launched out of Secret Invasion and Dark Reign and gave us the excellent character of Faiza Hussan. For my money, the most entertaining continuations of the major players have continued in some of the 2010's best Marvel books. Uncanny X-Force, for example, by Rick Remender and various artists, including Greg Tacchini here in, the, um, in this targeted uh, Otherworld book is a story where Jamie Braddock is, and, and spoilers here for those of you who haven't read Uncanny X-Force, is ultimately murdered, but like heroically? Which is kind of the thing that happens to Black Sheep family members in that book. But the entire Uncanny X-Force, you know, it's a trial of Phantom X, the Otherworld, the Captain Britain Corps, bring uh, Phantom X to Otherworld for crimes committed earlier in the Uncanny X-Force series, and they put him on trial, but basically this leads to one of the most memorable other world stories that I've read, um, checking out, you know, some of my faves of the 2010s. We've actually seen Jamie Braddock since that time, shouts to Infinity Countdown, but this is the most memorable story of his this decade. Journey into Mystery uh, is another one where we've seen Other World during the Everything Burns crossover. Loki is assigned a mission to affect Other World's civil war. Journey into Mystery, definitely worth reading as a whole as well. Speaking of series worth reading as a whole, Hickman and Isad Ribich's Secret Wars is my favorite thing. Uh, Captain Britain does not have a good time at the hands of Hickman, first losing an eye during New Avengers, and then getting gutted in a duel with Mr. Sinister once we've finally actually made it to Battle World proper. 
pre-House of X and Powers of X also saw a couple major developments for the Braddocks. First, via the X-Men Gold Annual, co-written by the excellent Leah Williams, Brian and Megan had a baby. And also the baby's preposterously smart, even rivaling the likes of Valeria Richards in terms of uncomfortably rapid child development. I'll admit I didn't necessarily expect this bit of continuity to make it through to Excalibur, but lo and behold, it does. Most controversial, Betsy also returned to her original Betsy Braddock body, a.k.a. white Englishwoman, freeing Quanon, Japanese assassin woman, back up to apparently star in the upcoming Fallen Angels. This happened in the pages of Hunt for Wolverine, Mystery, and Madripoor, and if you're considering reading the Hunt for Wolverine debacle rather than proceeding directly into House and Dawn of X, I beseech thee to reconsider. All right, all that brings us to Excalibur number one in Dawn of of X. Hopefully you feel like you have some rapid grounding now in Excalibur and in the history of the Braddock family. Let's talk then about what is the role of Excalibur in this new era for X-Men. The team, as it's been put together in this first issue, we have Betsy Braddock, Apocalypse, Rogue, Gambit, Trinary, who was debuted in X-Men Red, which is an excellent series and she's a really cool new character, and Jubilee for like absolutely no reason, at least yet. Okay, how does Excalibur fit? What is the hook? Tackling the world of magic. Otherworld's always been a high fantasy in the X-Men's D&D playground. You know, it's been at the center of the Otherworld mythos. But Teeny Howard and Marcus Toe, the creators here on Excalibur, are doubling down on the witchcraft and sorcery. This is a world where the queen of Otherworld is Morgan Le Fay, and the flowers of Krakoa are messing with the magic of Avalon. Morgan Le Fay actually has a nice long history in Marvel continuity, um, she has at times, you know, more recently befriended the likes of Doctor Doom, befriended perhaps romantically. So she's been around. She's a recurring character and a really nice addition to the Excalibur mythos, at least to kick things off with. Gates from Krakoa can lead to other dimensions. This is tremendously exciting to me as it opens so many doors, hooray puns, for the future of this series. Especially since Apocalypse is the one asking, in what other realms could we build a home and what would it cost? This is super exciting to me. The idea of Excalibur being this reality-hopping series, especially when you factor in Apocalypse leading the charge. Speaking of, this is also the Epoc Apocalypse book, and he is not the Apocalypse we've known. The first data page opens with this incredible line, as Apocalypse introduced himself to his fellow sorcerers. I swear I did a triple take when I saw that. <laughs> that is not the apocalypse I have known. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in terms of what that means for the book and the theorizing. But again, like this is a huge, huge shift for this longtime X-Men villain. This is... Right. This is the Braddock's book as well. And they, well, they are still kind of the Braddock's we've known. At least if you know your history. Gold Balls, now comically trying to rebrand as Egg, uh, Anne, takes Bets, Betsy to a rehatched Jamie Braddock doing filthy things in his egg, <laughs> which is great. I love how Excalibur begins digging into some of the discomfort of everyone resurrected on Krakoa with, with Betsy Braddock showing up and she's awkwardly eyeing Quanon before winding up in the infuriating presence of her brother Jamie. These are two people Betsy does not want to spend time with. And I think this is something we really haven't seen done uh, with any regularity on Krakoa so far is we've mashed up all of these mutants with long histories and many times animosities towards each other. And there was the big moment in House of X where, you know, like the likes of Wolverine is giving the Gorgon, uh, you know, an individual who like they've tried to kill each other or have killed each other on various occasions. They're sharing a beer. Here we actually get the the slightly more realistic take on that which is Betsy and Jamie having this sibling history that they you know cannot shake like the number of times that Jamie has upended Betsy's life or just been kind of a, a dweeb <laughs> you know right like this is this is awkward for her and it's uncomfortable and it's kind of nice to see that begin to play out if you've invested in these characters over time by issue's end, we also get the transformation of Betsy Braddock to the new Captain Britain, which is a mantle she has worn before. Uh, that said, it's still, I think, a welcome addition to Betsy's character. You know, if she's not going to be the Quanon Psylocke, uh, you know, like, personality that we've known. And, and, you know, I should call out here, Betsy was going as Psylocke before 
before she was ever in Quanon's body. Um, but that said, we've made the shift back now to purple hair English woman. So I think going full Captain Britain is a potentially more sensible mantle for her to wear. And it's, it, you know, it's infinitely better than Lady Britain, which is a title she has worn, uh, for example, in the pages of Uncanny X-Force. All right. The big questions. Number one, is Apocalypse a wizard now? I mean, yes. <laughs> He's communing with sorcerers, raising toast to the history of magic, and apparently Clan Akaba, or a sect thereof, are dedicated covens. They, you know, they're dedicated to witchcraft. This one's definitely a lot to take in because it doesn't quite fit the picture of Apocalypse I have from a lifetime-loving Age of Apocalypse and X-Men the Animated Series. As House of X number 5 made clear, though, this is a new phase for N. Sabiner, or however us mere humans can translate the dope A symbol he insists everyone call him. You know, ever since Prince turned himself into a symbol, that's the vibe Apocalypse is on right now. The challenge for Teeny Howard, Marcus II, and anyone utilizing the character now is that his survival of the fittest shtick is a bit tired. And besides the point, in Krakoa, Apocalypse, Apocalypse even says as much in this issue, instead focusing his efforts on mutant expansion to new realities and magical realms. It's an intriguing fit for the first mutant and some revisionist history that I can see working very, very well. There's a ton we don't know about this character who spans centuries. So sure, let's, let's mix magic into that mix and see where it takes us. Question number two, who's the White Witch? My first thought here was Emma Frost, the once and future White Queen, but that's probably just a function of Marauders and the Hellfire Club still riding around inside my head. The more likely answer is that Morgan Le Fay's White Witch is none other than Saturnine, the longtime Omniversal Magistrix of Otherworld. I'd be pretty surprised if this wasn't the answer, which is a good thing in my book. Saturnine typically means wild Captain Britain Corps adventures across all realities. They've had She's had a long history in the pages of Excalibur. There are, as you can see in the image here on the YouTube screen, multiple variations of her as well across the multiverse. You know, an infinity of doppelgangers, as she says. So which Saturnine this is, we don't know. But I'm very, very confident that the White Witch is going to be Saturnine. Does a single word choice in a data page mean Teeny Howard is setting up the coolest cosmic crossover ever? Probably not, <laughs> but I'll be gosh darned if I don't pitch the theory anyway. The final data page in Excalibur number one lingers on the word magus. Here's the full line. Hail the defenders of the magic of Avalon. Slay the pretenders who need not the humility of the magus. As stated in Coven Akava's Invocation of the Gods, the line is in reference to a curse being placed on mutants attempting to wield the magic of Otherworld, at least how the, that's how I interpret it, and yes, Magus in this context effectively just means sorcerer. But, but, what if, hot on the heels of Howard's own work writing Jim Starlin's Magus in the pages of her Thanos mini, she can find a way to weave Adam Warlock, more magic references, evil doppelganger, into the fabric of Excalibur. Hey, it's not super likely, but it's not a 0% possibility, and that's reason enough to get super excited. So there you have it. That is how Excalibur number one fits into the dawn of X. For my money, this book brought a lot to the table. There's a lot of interesting developments here for the Braddocks and for Apocalypse and for the role of magic in the, in the X-Men universe, as it's going to be. So I'm excited to see where this series goes. Now, I will say, it didn't hit me with the same sort of House of X powers of 10 high that X-Men number one or Marauders number one did. Those books are more thoroughly integrated. This book, despite occurring in vast majority on Krakoa and not being possible without the developments of like House of X-5 and Apocalypse coming to Krakoa, it felt the most like an X-Men book that could have launched before House of X and Powers of Ten, right? Like, this could be an approach to a new Excalibur relaunch outside of this moment, outside of the Dawn of X. Now, it's not, right? And there's a lot that's going to play out, I think, that could make it way more thoroughly integrated. And we've also had plenty of hints and plenty, not even hints, we've just had outright declarations from, like, the X-Men line editor, Jordan D. White, or Hickman himself, saying, you know, these Marauders ties in most closely to the books right now. Hickman's writing a chunk of New Mutants, so that's going to tie in most closely as he sets in, up some New Mutants things that he wants to play with down the line. The other books, though, are not going to be like, this isn't, these aren't event tie-ins. You know, they're kicking off new series, they're kicking off new ideas and things. They are going to feel 
a little more outside. And that is the vibe Excalibur gives. It's kind of it's kind of a tough one because we've had, what is it, 13 weeks, 14 weeks straight of this amazing rush of X-Men. And Excalibur number one is probably the first come down a little bit because of how high I was on Marauders. I think it's good. I think it still sets up a lot. I think the biggest challenge is the most interesting part of this book to me, character-wise, involvement-wise, is Apocalypse, right? Everything with Apocalypse, what he's doing on the island, what what he's doing with magic is completely fascinating. I love that. I really want to see where that's going. That means a lot for the world of X-Men that we're getting excited about. The stuff that is harder to get into for me is the Braddocks. I gave the history here of the family. I gave the history here of Excalibur. But historically, they haven't been characters that I'm super fascinated to follow. So really honing in on on Betsy Braddock as the new Captain Britain only does so much for me. And then because it's a first issue, we only got so much of Rogue and Gambit. You know, I barely talked about them, but there's a, a chunk of their relationship here coming off of their marriage that happened prior to House of X and Powers of Ten. Um, you know, we got like nothing of Jubilee, although, although I will note, as a commenter asked here on the YouTube channel on CBH, can Jubilee bring her non-mutant Shogo onto Krakoa? The answer is yes. We do have confirmation. Jubilee is allowed to bring her son. It seems like mutants can basically, you can bring a plus one so long because, because Betsy does, says the same thing with Brian, who is not a mutant, Brian Braddock. Um, you know, hey, I can bring a plus one, uh, so long as they are, you know, accompanied by a mutant. That's good. I'm glad Jubilee can have her boy with her. And I'm also glad she didn't bring him to Apocalypse. Good sense, Jubilee, even though I don't totally understand why you needed to be on this team yet. We also don't get a ton of Trinary, aside from being sort of like a connective, uh, um, I don't want to call her a lackey, but like she's working with Apocalypse. She's also sassing a bit, which is awesome, when he's insisting everyone call him his, his weird new symbol. Um, but Trinary is an awesome character, too. So there's potential on this oddly assembled team. Obviously, that's what a first issue is meant to do, is to say, here's the potential. Where are we going with this? We don't know. So the tension right now is all of the interesting gates to multiple realities, apocalypse and magic, all of that is really interesting. The Braddocks and a war in Otherworld, less so, possibly, you know, depending on what you're super into. And I think that's kind of why this issue you know, totters and doesn't necessarily feel like an absolute knockout. So I'm definitely going to be reading more of this as the series continues. I think hopefully I've laid out the case for what you would want to be, what is important to you. Do you love the, do you love Apocalypse? Do you love the Captain Britain mythos? Do you love Betsy Braddock and Psylocke, right? Over time. Um, if those, if those answers are all yes, you may want to explore Excalibur number one. If your answers are kind of no, that's not why I'm into this moment in X-Men. Uh, Excalibur may be a series in the Dawn of X that you pass over, right? More to come. I'm going to be very interested to keep following. But this one for me is a, is, should you check it out? Yes, probably, but not with the fervor that I recommended Marauders, right? Like, I, I still think this is a good comic. I want this series to be good, and I want to see where it goes. Um, but it definitely had the moment of like, hmm. I feel like we're coming down a second, which which was inevitable, which was inevitable. Like I said, 13, 14 weeks of really good X-Men, like there was going to be a slight dip. And even if it's a dip from great to good, we're still in a good place. So thanks for listening, everybody. This has been the Excalibur number one review and theorizing. Um, again, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com. If you like what I'm doing here, go check out comicbookherald.com. You can like and subscribe to the YouTube channel on Comic Book Herald, or you can always subscribe to the podcast on Best Comics Ever. Thanks again, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.